Welcome to another tutorial video. This one is going to be focused on real estate and specifically the real estate pro forma, which is extremely important if you want to do financial analysis of real estate deals and investments. Now, normally these videos address questions that come in and we try to answer them as quickly and concisely as possible, but this one's actually not a response to a reader or viewer question. It's just an important topic and it actually corresponds to a blog post on mergers and acquisitions on the real estate pro forma, but we're going to expand on the article here and show you more of the Excel parts and also show you a few of the more advanced features that you might see with real estate pro formas. So the plan for this tutorial first is to cover why the real estate pro forma matters and exactly what it is. Then we'll go through a simple real estate pro forma and show you some of the calculations in Excel and how to come up with the numbers. Then I'll show you how to build scenarios into a pro forma using an example for a multifamily property. And you'll see how the number is different and some things to consider when you're including scenarios in this type of model. And then in part four, I will explain some of the differences for other property types, such as hotels, and explain a few of the more advanced items in pro formas. Let's go to part one first and talk about why the real estate pro forma matters and what goes into it. The basic idea here is that just as companies have financial statements, the income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow statement, properties also have financial statements. But just like you don't really need all the financial statements to model or value a company, you can also take some shortcuts and skip the full financial statements with properties. You see this all the time with companies when we have DCF analyses, for example. When we project a company's free cash flow, we start with revenue, we list operating expenses to get to operating income, we get to NOPAT, we adjust for non-cash charges, and we list working capital and capital expenditures to get to unlevered free cash flow, but we don't include full three statement projections for the company. All we need are the items that actually go into free cash flow so we can use that to value the company in a DCF. With properties, you can do the same thing. And so a pro forma is sort of like a combined and simplified income statement and cash flow statement for a property rather than a company. Now, the structure of a real estate pro forma, moving into part two now, is that you always start with potential revenue, which represents what a property would earn from rental income if it were 100% occupied at market rates. In our pro forma here, you can see up at the top, this base rental income line represents that potential rental income. If the property were 100% occupied at market rates, we make some deductions. Then we list the property's operating expenses, items like maintenance, utilities, insurance, property taxes, things like that. Then we list capital costs, which are very similar to capital expenditures and the change of working capital for normal companies. These correspond to longer term items that are going to last for more than one year. You can see that in this section down here, CapEx, TIs and LCs. TI stands for tenant improvements. LC stands for leasing commissions. And we'll get into both of those in a little bit. And then below that, we show the debt service, the interest expense, and the debt principal repayments below it. And that gets us to cash flow to equity investors. So that's the basic shape and structure. Let's go into each part now in a little bit more detail so I can show you some of the numbers here. So the base rental income, as I said, is the potential rental income if the property were 100% occupied and every single tenant there paid proper market rents. So in our example here, you can see what we're doing. We are simply taking the base rental income from each tenant. And in this case, there is no difference between market rents and in-place rents, what the tenants are actually paying. And then what we're also doing in the last part of the formula is we're taking the total square feet in the property and subtracting the number that are actually occupied and then just multiplying by one of the tenants rates so that even though the property is not 100% occupied, we are pretending like it is 100% occupied in this line item. Common deductions and adjustments here include the absorption and turnover vacancy, concessions and free rent, expense reimbursements, and general vacancy. So let's go into each of those and explain what they mean. The absorption and turnover vacancies for when a tenant leaves and it takes several months to find a new tenant. This is not an expense. It's just a loss of potential rental income. So it's foregone rental income when there's no tenant there. If you look at some of our calculations for the absorption and turnover vacancy here, what's happening is that we take the base rental income that a tenant would normally be paying, but then we say, actually, there is a chance, a 30% chance here, because our renewal probability is 70%. So there's a 30% chance this tenant will not renew. And if the tenant does not renew, it will take us six months, so half the year, to find a new tenant. Therefore, we're going to reduce this by half 
of the year's rental income and we're going to multiply by that 30% non-renewal probability and that's what gets us to our absorption and turnover vacancy. Concessions and free rent is another common adjustment here and the idea is that it's an incentive for a new tenant to move in or for an existing tenant to renew. When this happens, you might give the tenant a few months of free rent, so maybe six months on a five-year lease or 12 months on a 10-year lease or something like that. In our model here, we separate it into non-renewal and renewal cases, but the basic idea is pretty similar, which is that we look at the base rental income that the tenant would normally be paying. And then if we give the tenant three months of free rent, we deduct that amount. So three over 12, 25% of the year, and we deduct that and we count that as concessions and free rent. And then in the case where the tenant does not renew, the new tenant case, we give the tenant six months of free rent. And so we reduce the base rental income by 50% in that case, and we multiply by the non-renewal probability of 30%. Expense reimbursements represent another common adjustment. These are simply the amounts of property taxes, insurance, and maintenance and utilities that, you, that tenants are responsible for. And this varies greatly based on lease types. For example, going back to our pro forma, for a single net lease, the tenant is not responsible for all that much. They're basically just responsible for real estate and property taxes. So for tenant number two here, all we do is look at their proportion of the space they're occupying, and then we multiply that by the total real estate and property taxes for the property. We may have to factor in some other things, but that's the basic idea. We just include their proportionate share of the real estate and property taxes. However, tenant number three is on a triple net lease, which means that their expense reimbursements correspond to maintenance, utilities, insurance, and property taxes. So we have to add up all of those and then multiply by their proportional share. And then one final adjustment here is the general vacancy. This is for spaces that are permanently vacant, which means there are no current tenants and there are no plans to get any additional tenants anytime soon. So you can see the line item right here. All we're doing is taking our total, total rentable square feet. We're subtracting the amount that is actually occupied right now. And then we're multiplying by the market rental rate, which we're assuming corresponds to what tenant number one here is paying in terms of rent per square foot. Now, once we've made all those deductions and adjustments, we get to something called effective gross income. This is sort of like net sales or net revenue for a normal company, but it's on a cash basis instead. So we're not using accrual accounting here. This is much more of a cash based number. Let's go to the next section now and talk about some of the expenses. Common ones here are the property management fee, which is often a percentage of effective gross income, maintenance and utilities, these are often based on a per square foot number and then they grow at a certain rate each year or maybe the per square foot number changes on a certain based on a certain rate each year the real estate and property taxes are almost always based on a percent of the property value so if we pay 25 million for a property and property taxes are four percent per year and they grow at a certain rate we'll use that for our assumption there and then we have something called the reserve so the reserve for capital costs or capex ti's and lc's here the reserves exist to smooth out the property's cash flows as large, irregular capital costs come up. For example, if we allocate $200,000 per year over five years to this item, then if we have no capital costs in year one and two, that's fine. We build up a reserve of $400,000. But then when we get $600,000 of capital costs in year three, we'll have $600,000 exactly in our reserve by then, so we can use that to cover those costs. Then in year four, we go to zero initially, we allocate another 200,000, we allocate another 200,000 in year five, and then in year five, when we have 400,000 capital costs, we just deduct those from our reserve and use our reserves to cover them without having to dip into our cash flows. And you can see the way it works here. We have our reserves allocated, and then when capital costs come up, as they do in years three and four here, we simply pay them out of our reserves. And in year four, we fall a little bit short of that. We don't have quite enough in our reserves to cover everything, but we do cover the majority of these expenses with our reserves. And that's the purpose of this item. Let's go to the next part now and talk about capital costs. The three main items here are capital expenditures or CapEx, tenant improvements or TIs, and then leasing commissions or LCs. CapEx includes items that are not specific to one tenant, but are just general improvements, maintenance, and upgrades for the property. So it might be a new roof, a new elevator, new air conditioning, a new heating system, something like that. 
Tenant improvements are items that are specific to an individual tenant paid as an incentive to the tenant for the tenant to move in or renew the lease. So this might be something like modifying the space and adding an additional wall or doors or setting up the office differently or something like that. And then leasing commissions are paid to brokerage companies and real estate agents and brokers to find new tenants. And these are typically a small percentage of the total lease value of the tenant. Tenant improvements are almost always based on a per square foot value or per square meter value. So we've calculated them like that for the individual tenants here. Leasing commissions though, we have to take the tenant's rate that they're paying, multiply by the number of square feet, and then multiply by the lease term, which is 10 years in this case. So we do all that, and then we multiply by whatever small percentage it is, 1%, 3%, 5%, something in that range usually. And if we wanna be really fancy, we can take into account the fact that leases escalate over time, and so this rate will go up over time, and so we should be taking that into account, but in the simplified model, we just sort of skip over it. Stepping back and looking at this at a high level now, we have a couple items here at the bottom of our pro forma or toward the bottom that are worth discussing. First is net operating income, then adjusted net operating income, and then cash flow to equity investors after the debt service. Net operating income is similar to EBITDA for normal companies, and it's critical in valuation because you almost always base a property's value on net operating income divided by something called a cap rate or capitalization rate, which represents the yield of the property, 4%, 5%, 8%, something like that. Adjusted NOI represents NOI minus net capital costs, and it's similar to unlevered free cash flow for normal companies because it's the core business cash flow after capital costs, ignoring capital structure. And you can see that here because the adjusted NOI line item is before we show the interest expense and debt principal repayments. And then right below that, we have cash flow to equity, which is adjusted NOI minus the debt service. It's closer to the distributions made to the equity investors or the owners of the property. Properties rarely accumulate large cash balances as companies sometimes do. They tend to simply pay out the cash they generate each year to the property owners unless they need to set aside some for the reserves or for some other major upcoming item or something like that. So that's it for the most common items on a real estate pro forma. Let's go into part three now and talk about scenarios on a pro forma. And to do this, we'll walk through a quick example of a multifamily pro forma for a property in Seattle, an apartment building there. Scenarios are important to factor in because all investing is probabilistic. You need to think about not what happens in just one case, but also what happens if the deal goes very well, or it's just average, or it goes really poorly. In this multifamily pro forma, we have a couple new items. We have something called loss to lease that represents the difference between in-place rents and market rents, which is very common. We have bad debt and concessions, which represents tenants literally just not paying, just disappearing or being late and then ending up not paying. Items that wouldn't really come up with an office or industrial property, but which could easily happen when individuals are paying. We have some more details on the expenses here as well, although they're broadly the same as what we saw in the last example for an office or retail property. The typical approach when you have scenarios is to show a base upside and downside case. Sometimes you'll show not just three cases, but maybe five or seven cases. And then to have differences in rent, vacancy, bad debt, expenses, tenant improvements, and leasing commissions in each of these cases. Now in credit cases, when you're not looking at the company as an equity investor, but rather as a credit investor, so a senior lender or mezzanine investor, you will often focus on the base downside and extreme downside cases because the upside is very limited. And so you want to assess your chances of actually losing money in the deal. That is exactly what we do here because we have base downside and extreme downside cases, but we don't even care about the upside case at all. The key idea with scenarios is that everything is connected. So if there is a recession, which pushes down market rents, then the vacancy rate is also going to increase as a result because it's harder to find tenants and it's harder to fill properties when there is a recession like that. So here, for example, if you look at some of our cases, in the downside and extreme downside cases, we assume a recession in years two and three, which is why the rents fall here. And sure enough, when the rents fall, the general vacancy rates rise. The bad debt and concessions also rise when that happens, and expenses grow at a slower rate in a recession as well. So that's the key principle you have to keep in mind. You can't just blindly assume that rents go up and then the vacancy rate also goes up. That doesn't really make any sense. Everything here has to be interconnected. 
it'll be harder and more expensive to find new tenants. And so the tenant improvements and leasing commissions will also go up, which is why these grow at higher rates when there's a recession. And then when the recession is over, these fall back down to their normal levels. In this model, the idea is that there's currently a 7.5% discount to market rents across all the tenants in the building. So we're going to spend on CapEx, improve the building, maybe install a new roof, maybe improve the interiors and lobbies, other things like that, and reduce that discount over time. Regardless of what happens, we're going to spend that money and the discount will go away. But depending on market conditions, all the other numbers here will differ. If you look at the base case here, the base case is pretty much stable growth. We have rent growing between three and 5% per year. We have the vacancy rate staying the same. The bad debt stays the same. The expenses grow at around two to 4% per year, just under the rental growth rate. Tenant improvements grow at about the same rate. And leasing commissions remain at 3% of effective rent. In the downside case, we have a mild recession. And so market rents here fall in years two and three before recovering. The general vacancy rate rises before recovering back to its 3% level. Bad debt and concessions rise before recovering back to their three or 4% level. Expenses fall in years two and three before recovering and then rising again. And then the tenant improvements and leasing commissions go up to much higher levels before falling back to the normal levels. And then the extreme downside case is just even more severe. So we don't have a rental drop of just 3% or 1%, but rather it goes all the way down to a 6% drop, which is pretty significant. And all the other numbers are following the same basic format, but, the, but they're just more extreme in general. So you might be asking, what's the point of this? What advantage do we really get from scenarios in a deal like this? And the answer is here, for example, they let us figure out that the pro proposed financing structure will just not work. To show you an example, I'll go down to the sensitivity tables here. And you can see here that things look pretty bad for the equity investors. They lose money pretty much all the time in the extreme downside case and even most of the time in the downside case. But what's really notable is that even the lenders here, the mezzanine investors could potentially lose money in the extreme downside case, the preferred equity investors, which is also a form of debt, frequently lose money in the extreme downside case as well. So we can just look at these scenarios and tell based on the IRRs and the recoveries that the deal is not going to be viable with 85% leverage as it currently uses. Normally the goal for credit investors, lenders, is to avoid losing money no matter what happens, even if there's a disastrous recession, and to come close to their targeted IRR in other cases. The goal for equity investors is usually to aim for a certain IRR in the base and upside case, and then to avoid losing money in the downside case. So that's a bit about scenarios. Let's go briefly into a few more advanced items and see what pro formas and other sectors like hotel properties look like. So the basic difference is that for a hotel, the pro forma is quite different and it looks more like the income statement of a normal company. We have revenue categories like rooms and food and beverages. And then for the expenses, we have fixed versus variable expenses. Sales and marketing and G&A can be much bigger and margins tend to be lower. Here's an example of a hotel pro forma. For revenue, it's split into rooms, food and beverage and other. Expenses, departmental expenses rather, are also split into those categories. These are sort of like cost of goods sold or cost of services or cost of sales for a normal company. We have gross operating income, and then we have undistributed expenses, which are variable expenses, and then fixed expenses, which as the name implies are fixed expenses. So you can see items like sales and marketing, general and administrative repairs and maintenance are all categories here. We still get to net operating income, but it's a little bit different here. Margins are quite a bit lower. Margins are between 20% and 30% whereas you might see 50% to 70% margins for multifamily properties, apartment buildings, for example. So it's much closer to what a normal business outside the real estate sector would look like because really a hotel is the closest thing to a normal operating business within the real estate sector. A few more advanced items on the pro forma are the loss to lease, which we actually just covered. It just represents the difference between market rents and in-place rents. And then there's also something called percentage rent, where retail tenants might pay a percent of their monthly sales in addition to fixed rent. Often this is used to negotiate a deal and maybe a tenant will agree to lower fixed rent if they pay more in percentage rent or vice versa. So it's often used as a negotiating tactic when setting up leases. That's it for this lesson. So let's do a recap and summary now.
The real estate proof format is super important because it lets you analyze a property, decide whether or not a deal is good, and then also value the property and see what it looks like after you buy it, after you renovate it, or after you develop the property. And it's similar to a combined and simplified income statement and cash flow statement, but for a property rather than a company. We went through a simple real estate pro forma Excel, and you saw some of the calculations here and how we arrive at some of these numbers on a tenant by tenant basis in a simplified model. We always start with our potential revenue. We make deductions and adjustments. Then we list our operating expenses to get to our net operating income. We list the capital costs, and then we get to our adjusted net operating income and our debt service, and then our cash flow to equity investors below that. When we incorporate scenarios into a pro forma, as we did in the multifamily example here, the key is to realize that everything is interconnected. So if we assume there's a recession where rents fall, the vacancy rate should also rise, bad debt should also rise, expenses should fall or rise at a slower rate, and items like TIs and LCs should also rise at a higher rate as it gets harder to find tenants. And then when there's a recovery, it should reverse and all those numbers should go back to their normal states. Then we went through a hotel pro forma very briefly and you saw how it's different. It's much closer to what you see for a normal company. And we talked about a few of the more advanced items like loss to lease and percentage rent. That's it for this tutorial. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of how real estate pro formas work, some of the key items and what goes into the calculations. You can also look at the Excel file and the accompanying blog post right below this video, which I'll link to in the description below.